I've made this video for those of you who may not have the time or inclination to view all the videos in my Case for an Evil God series, or who would like to see the strongest evidence against God summarized in a single location. The point of this video is to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that if the God of the Bible exists, he is necessarily evil. The most evil being to ever exist, in fact. As with the other videos in the series, this video is primarily directed toward fundamentalist Christians, those who believe the Bible is the literal word of God. But many of the arguments also pertain to more moderate strains of Christianity and even Islam and other religions. I have included examples of the relevant scripture with each of my claims for you to look up and verify yourself, and I have included links to more detailed references in the description bar. To start with, if you were trying to imagine the most evil god possible, you might come up with a psychopathic monster who would destine his creations to be pointlessly tortured for all eternity. But to be even more cruel, perhaps this evil god would first have most of those creations live a few relatively pleasant decades, just long enough to experience love, happiness, joy, and all the other good things in life, only to then snatch it all away and leave them to be tormented by memories of that life during their eternal suffering. To further accentuate this betrayal, perhaps this evil god would have promised his creations a heavenly afterlife, contingent upon following the right religion, but then remained hidden from his creations so well that thousands of conflicting religions developed, ensuring that the vast majority of his creations would choose the wrong religion and thus inadvertently damn themselves. And what about those few who did manage to choose the right religion? Well, assuming this evil god was a narcissistic megalomaniac, he might allow them to spend eternity worshipping him, stroking his ego. The thing is, this description of the ultimate evil god fits the god of the Bible perfectly. Before laying out my case, I'd like to begin with a working definition of evil. Some theists would define it as anything god is against, as a way of ending the argument before it even starts, which is ironic for a group so concerned that morality be objective. Basing right and wrong on the whims of God would be the ultimate in subjective morality, since whether or not an act is moral would depend entirely on whom you are, rather than on what you do. Morality is about behavior, not celebrity. In any case, if we defined evil as whatever God doesn't like, then we would have to come up with another term to use for the abusive behavior that ranges from bullying to committing atrocities, and that's what I would be arguing instead. So rather than invent some other term for that, I'll use a definition of evil most people can accept, behavior that deliberately and unnecessarily causes harm and suffering. When asked for examples of evil, almost everyone, including nearly all Christians, will list such behaviors as murder and genocide, torture, animal and human sacrifice, slavery, rape, cannibalism, child and animal abuse, theft, incest, betrayal, and lying. Christians naturally associate those evil acts with Satan, but the Bible itself shows it's actually God who is guilty of condoning, ordering, and even committing the very behaviors we ourselves use to identify evil. God orders people to murder their own friends and families and brutally slaughter innocent babies. He personally murders countless thousands of children, as well as drowns virtually the entire population of the earth. He tortures people for no discernible reason other than to cause pain and suffering, for all eternity in most cases. He demands and accepts animal and even human sacrifices. He not only orders people into slavery for life and allows slaveholders to inflict horrific abuse upon them, but he also requires slaves to just accept it. He condones rape, he requires rape victims to marry their own rapists, and he even orders young girls forced into what amounts to sexual slavery. He threatens to force parents to eat their own children. He orders the cruel abuse of animals and even commits it himself. He orders people to steal from others, and he forces people to commit incest. He betrays people by deliberately setting them up to fail, and then punishing them harshly for failing. And he even lies to people, both directly and indirectly. Surprisingly, many Christians aren't even aware of these rather obvious problems, primarily because so many of them don't read the Bible, or they read only the nicer sounding sections, which is why atheists tend to know the Bible better than most Christians. Unsurprisingly, apologists who become aware of these problems often end up selectively ignoring the contradictions in the Bible that don't fit their beliefs, or they creatively reinterpret scripture in order to make God's behavior appear less evil. 
Ironically, that often requires adding meaning to scripture that is neither explicitly nor implicitly stated, something the Bible clearly forbids them to do. But probably the worst mistake apologists make is to fail to think through the consequences of their claims. For example, they often blame mankind for God's actions against us, saying we bring it on ourselves and that God has to commit these atrocities in order to make the best of a bad situation. But if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, as the Bible claims, then by definition he is capable of easily arranging events to avoid those bad situations occurring in the first place. For instance, God knew that if he started mankind with Adam and Eve, the result would be hundreds of millions of people becoming wicked and that he would end up drowning the entire world. He could have simply started the world with Noah and his family instead, thus avoiding such massive, senseless slaughter. Or he could have never created Lucifer. Or he could have fixed humanity so nobody would become wicked. Or any number of other peaceful solutions. But time after time, God has instead shown a preference to respond with some of the most cruel and brutal punishments. The usual apologist counter to this accusation is to claim that God cannot violate our free will, which is rather ridiculous since God's responses all cause violation of someone's free will, something that becomes obvious by simply thinking about them from the victim's point of view. Yet the free will narrative remains critical to the apologist's defense of God. The claim is that God gave angels and humanity free will because he doesn't want robot worshippers. Instead, he wants everyone to choose to believe in and love him. This freedom, unfortunately, requires us to have the capacity to commit atrocities against one another. Then Lucifer chose to rebel against God and Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, the two events that resulted in the fall of man. That soon led to all humanity becoming wicked, requiring God to drown the entire world in a flood and start all over. And it will eventually lead him to sending the vast majority of humanity to burn in hell for all eternity. Thus, once again, it's not God who's to blame for the evil in the world. We are. But there are some huge problems with that narrative, starting with that most important context that apologists inevitably ignore, the biblical claim that God is all-powerful and all-knowing. If this claim is true, that means God could have created any universe he wanted from an infinite variety of options. That's what all-powerful means. And assuming it's possible for people to choose between right and wrong, then by definition there could be universes where everyone happens to make the right decisions. God had to know which universes those would be, and he could have chosen to create one of them. But he didn't. He chose one where he knew Lucifer would choose to rebel, where he knew Adam and Eve would choose to eat the fruit, where he knew humanity would become wicked and deserve drowning, and where he knew he would send billions of people to burn in hell for all eternity. This is the universe God chose to create, and thus he is the one who bears full responsibility for the consequences. Yet not only does he blame humanity for his own choices, he makes salvation based on accepting his forgiveness, and he sends anyone who doesn't accept this gift to hell to suffer eternal torment with no way out. This blame the victim mentality is emphasized by the fact that God created Adam and Eve incapable of knowing that disobeying God was a sin. It wasn't until after they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they even understood the difference between good and evil. That means God set them up to fail, and he knew perfectly well that they would fail. Then he blamed them for their failure and made every generation since suffer for it. To make matters worse, it would appear our free will is only an illusion. Not only are there good scientific and philosophical reasons to believe free will doesn't actually exist, but nowhere in the Bible does it say we have free will. In fact, it clearly indicates that God plans everything, which is incompatible with free will. That would mean our choices are all predestined. Additionally, God clearly isn't concerned about limiting our free will, since he does nothing to prevent criminals from violating the free will of their victims, and the people who go to heaven won't have the freedom to commit sin. So there's no reason to believe God couldn't have created us incapable of committing atrocities while still having the capacity to choose to believe in and love him. The only reasonable conclusion is that God not only wants people to commit atrocities, he has deliberately arranged for them to do so. But even the whole claim that God wants us to choose to believe in and love him is completely unworkable because both belief and love develop on a subconscious level. It's impossible to simply choose to believe in something or love someone. If you doubt me, you can easily prove it to yourself. Pick someone you don't believe exists, maybe Santa Claus or Zeus or Darth Vader, 
and then try to will yourself to believe in and love him. I guarantee you'll fail. Of course, God could simply reveal himself to every person on earth so that everyone would believe he exists. At least then people could make an informed decision on whether or not to follow him. But instead, he hides from humanity so effectively that belief must be based on faith, not evidence. And faith is a terrible basis for belief, since it has resulted in the development of literally thousands of religions, all of which have their own gods, their own holy books, their own prophecies, their own miracles, and their own devoted followers who believe theirs is the only true religion. That's not even counting the tens of thousands of denominations within Christianity alone, many of which hold radically different and contradictory beliefs. The end result of this pointless lack of evidence is billions of sincerely misinformed souls destined for an eternity of torture. At least they theoretically have a chance of choosing the right religion. But what about the estimated tens of thousands of babies and young children who die of disease and starvation each and every day? According to the Bible, God creates everyone born into sin, and one must choose to follow God in order to achieve salvation, something the very young are, of course, incapable of doing. That would mean that God sits idly by doing nothing at all to help those thousands of innocent babies who die slow, lingering, agonizing deaths every single day, only to send them all to hell to burn forever. What could possibly be more evil than that? In order to avoid God appearing so cruel and heartless, apologists have invented what they call the Age of Accountability, meaning the age when one is mature enough to choose to follow God. Children who die younger than that age automatically go to heaven. Apart from the fact that this Age of Accountability doesn't exist in the Bible, the resulting implications are almost as ugly as God automatically sending babies to hell. Consider this. If salvation is the most important goal for humanity, and if only a small fraction of adults achieve salvation, while 100% of babies achieve salvation, then wouldn't it make theological sense to kill as many babies as possible? That is the logical conclusion. Even if God were to object to the practice, it would still be in accordance with his will of achieving as much human salvation as possible. Furthermore, all you would have to do after murdering all those babies would be to sincerely ask God for forgiveness, and you too would be saved. So either dead babies go to hell, or there is theological justification for murdering babies. Does that sound like something a good God would arrange? Or is that something you'd expect from an evil God? And what about salvation itself? According to the Bible, all the redeemed will be sent to live in a 1400 mile cube made of pure gold on a new earth with no oceans. They won't be able to sin, which, according to the apologist's claim that sin is the necessary consequence of free will, would mean they will lose their free will, assuming they ever had it in the first place. Furthermore, they will have all memories of their life on this earth erased, which means they won't even remember their friends and family. What they will do is worship God for all eternity. And that raises an important question. Why would a good God have any interest in being worshipped? The desire to be worshipped is a symptom of megalomania and sociopathic narcissism, personality traits common to the most evil people in history, never with anyone we would call good. So with all this evidence supporting the claim that the God of the Bible is evil, is there any evidence that he's good? Well, if you ask apologists, they will typically come up with such claims as, God is good because he created us. Except that if God created a few people to worship him and the rest to torture for all eternity, then creating us wouldn't be an act of goodness at all, would it? God is good because he sacrificed his only son for us. Except that an evil God would have no problem killing his own son, would he? Besides, since Jesus was resurrected, and with even more superpowers than before, it wasn't much of a sacrifice, was it? God is good because there is beauty and love in the world. Except that there is ugliness and hate in the world, too, which by that logic would be evidence God is evil, right? God is good because he loves me like a parent loves a child. Except that what loving parent would abandon his child to be tortured in hell forever for not worshipping him? Does it really need to be said that deliberately and pointlessly inflicting ultimate suffering on one's child isn't love, but instead pure evil? God is good because goodness exists, and therefore there must be an ultimate standard of goodness, which is God. Except that you can just as easily say that because evil exists, there must be an ultimate standard of evil, which is God. But the existence of morality is easy to explain from a purely naturalistic perspective, 
since social species have competitive advantages over solitary species, and genes that encourage cooperation and social cohesion are naturally selected for. Besides, it's obvious that if you want to be treated well, then treating others well is the best way to ensure that it happens. So no god is necessary for morality to develop. God is good because, just like darkness is the absence of light and cold is the absence of heat, evil is the absence of good and thus evil is the absence of God. Except that measurable physical properties don't equate to immeasurable moral philosophy. It would be just as meaningful to say that good is the absence of evil and thus good is the absence of God. God is good because he answers prayers. Sure, prayer sometimes works if you pray for something that could happen on its own anyway like finding your car keys, but pray for something that couldn't happen on its own, like the regeneration of an amputee's limbs, and despite what the Bible says, you and I both know it won't happen. God knows more than we do, thus we cannot judge his actions. Except that we can't make sound judgments based on what we don't know, only on what we do know, and we can't simply ignore apparent evil behavior on the off chance there's a good reason for it, or we risk enabling or even encouraging it. God is good because the Bible says he is. Except that an evil God would surely have no problem lying and claiming he's good, right? Besides, we know that actions speak louder than words, and God's actions in the Bible speak very loudly indeed. God is good because who would want to live in a universe where God is evil? Except that since when has reality ever cared about what we want? More importantly, Every claim theists have ever made for the existence of God is either a fallacious argument or something where a simpler naturalistic explanation would suffice. For example, the scientific evidence supports cosmological and biological evolution far better than it does creationism. Even the evidence Jesus existed at all comes almost exclusively from the Gospels, which were written by anonymous authors decades after Jesus supposedly lived. None of the original versions of that scripture have survived and there is not even a single first-hand independent secular account that Jesus ever existed, much less that he was divine. So there is no compelling reason to believe God exists at all. And for those concerned with the consequences of living in a godless world, be aware that the most atheistic nations on earth also tend to be the healthiest, with better life expectancy, better education, better incomes, lower crime rates, lower abortion rates, lower teen pregnancy rates, lower STD rates, and lower infant mortality than the United States, which is one of the most religious nations in the developed world. On the other hand, the world's most religious nations tend to be the poorest, least healthy, and most violent. So an atheistic world is one to look forward to. Now let's recap. The God of the Bible is a perfect fit for what we might imagine the ultimate evil God to be like. He deliberately and unnecessarily commits the behaviors we ourselves use to define evil. His defenders believe in an error-filled narrative of free will, choice, belief, and love to justify their God's behavior, but which under close inspection falls apart and only solidifies his evil. God shows a truly callous disregard for innocent children and deliberately creates conditions guaranteeing the eternal damnation of billions of people. And those relatively few who manage to achieve salvation apparently lose their memories and any free will they may have had, and then spend eternity worshipping a megalomaniac. Finally, the best arguments that God is good turn out to be little more than weak, fallacious assertions. Thus, the evidence reveals beyond all reasonable doubt that the God of the Bible is a cruel, malicious, evil monster. And if all these examples of God's egregious behavior fail to convince you he's evil, then I must ask, what acts would God have to commit in order for you to consider him evil? If your answer is nothing, then you can't claim to be a person of sound moral judgment, can you? Think about it. My videos in this series have been up on YouTube for years, and apologists have constantly argued against them. And yet, after all this time, they have never managed to present a convincing counter to my claims, as you can see for yourself in the comments sections. The problem is, most Christians don't see evidence against their God as clues to be followed to help them better understand reality. Instead, they see it as a challenge to their faith that must be overcome. So, despite the overwhelming evidence that they worship a God far more evil than the worst people in history, they usually end up concluding either that God works in mysterious ways, which means they have no argument and have effectively given up, 
or that God is all-powerful and thus can do whatever he wants, which doesn't make him good. It makes him a bully. And what are bullies if not evil? The prosecution rests its case. <laughs>